This week on Quality Digest Live, we talked to Jennifer Kurtz, Cyber Program Director at Manufacturers Edge, a NIST MEP center in Colorado. And we talked to her about manufacturing cybersecurity. Manufacturers are more and more becoming the target of hackers. Uh, what can they do about it, if anything? Join us in 30 seconds to find out. Welcome back to Quality Digest Live. QDL is your weekly look at who and what is making news in the world of quality. I'm Dirk Ducharme, Editor-in-Chief of Quality Digest. Almost every month, really almost every week sometimes, we hear about some sort of data breach or cyber attack. Uh, you know, Facebook, uh, Google+, Plus, uh, Marriott's, <laughs> not all that long ago, late last year. Uh, so as consumers, you know, we've really become uh, used to the idea that our data is not really all that secure. But it isn't just consumer companies and consumer data that are at risk. Manufacturers are under attack as well. According to one report, manufacturing has just surpassed any other sector, including financial services, as the greatest industry susceptible to cyber threats. According to Information Age, in 2018, almost half of UK manufacturing companies were subjected to cyber attacks. I'm sure that's probably similar in the United States. And the the problem may be flying under the radar. How big a problem is cybersecurity amongst manufacturers and what can they do to protect themselves against attacks? Well, joining us today to explain it is Jennifer Kurtz, Cyber Program Director at Manufacturers Edge, a NIST MEP center in Colorado and a representative of the MEP National Network. Jennifer works with entrepreneurs in the manufacturing sector to help companies comply with information security standards. Jennifer, thanks for joining us on Quality Digest Live. Ah, oh, you're welcome, my pleasure. All right. Happy to get the word out. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah, well, it sounds like it really needs to be gotten out. Um, uh, I think most people, as, as I said, most people think of cybersecurity on a personal level, some database gets hacked and, and you know, all my credit card information or so forth is you know, now in, in the hands of you know, uh, somebody somewhere to do whatever they want with. But hacking or data theft is just as important or maybe a more important issue for manufacturers as well, right? Definitely, and it's important for manufacturers on multiple levels. One is just has to do with the, the safety, basically the sanctity of their customer and their employee information, but in other areas as well, because manufacturers often have intellectual property that they don't necessarily recognize as being special. They just say, well, that's the way we do it. So it's, you know, anybody could do it this way, but others don't, and it's really what gives them a, a competitive edge. Another area in which we're beginning to see some some very scary stuff happening is in because of the the way the operations technology has been implemented in production facilities. You have technology that was never intended to be connected to the internet, and so now that it's connected, it's hackable, which which means that there are machines that are machine instructions that can be hacked remotely. Uh, in, in a recent case, this was done to, to actually cause personnel injury. So that some of the safety devices, for example, on machines in a production facility can be attacked in a way that, that removes those safety devices, those, those stoppers, and can actually injure uh, machine operators and so forth. So th those, are, those are some big areas in which manufacturers are vulnerable in ways that, um, that say a retailer would not be vulnerable in the same way with respect to personnel, personal safety, um, OSHA, that kind of thing. So, that, so that's interesting. So, so it, 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 more than just data, uh, which is kind of traditionally what we think about in terms of hacking, and, and obviously no company, no manufacturer would want maybe proprietary data you know, stolen or list of clients. I mean, there's a lot of things, industrial, you know, industrial uh, spying and so forth. Nobody wants that. But you're saying it's actually even at the physical level where their, their equipment is, is affected in some way. And that sounds like a lot more serious problem potentially. 
Exactly. That, so it's the safety features, but it, it's also that the, the machine code itself can be altered or compromised so that the result that you're getting is not is not what was programmed into the machine instructions initially. And that might not be picked up until you know further down the road when a customer actually has that machine on site that, that there have been changes to in effect the changes to the design. Um, and the expected outcomes. Okay, and, and I, I, mentioning that, I mean, I, I suppose if you could if you could change the way a machine operator, you could see where maybe something like a, a, a machine that made something like a, a CNC machine, you know, some sort of you could see where you could maybe change it slightly, so maybe the specs would be off, which might hurt you, uh, might be a boon to your competitors, and maybe not so good for you. So there's all sorts of there's all sorts well, of ways you can m massage it. Yeah, it's definitely a quality control issue because, you know, really what we're talking about in cybersecurity is data quality. And it's knowing that the data you're, on which your business depends is reliable, is has integrity, is what you think it is, it's where you think it is, it's being used by the people who are supposed to be using it and, and not by others who, who oughtn't have uh, authorized access to it. So, so there's a lot about quality that, that really rolls into cybersecurity issues, but that hasn't been, I don't think cybersecurity has been presented like that to the manufacturing community. And there has been a lot, of, there has been a lot of messaging around the dangers of attack and people, it, it's in our nature, I, I believe, to be optimistic, well, it's not gonna happen here. Um, and when it does happen here, the tendency is often not to share that information because nobody wants to call call themselves out as somebody who has been attacked uh, well, was, because of fear of loss of reputation uh, or trust. I was going to say that. Do, do you find in, in, in your work that, that companies, are they either unaware that they're at the kind of risk that they're at, or are they aware, but they're just kind of downplaying it e externally? I mean, what kind of, what's, what's the sense that you have in, in the manufacturing world about how big a problem this is, really? That's a great question. I, and a lot of the manufacturers we work with here in Colorado are, are really small shops. They're about 20, 20 employees or less. So, so they're very small shops. Um, also, there's a so there's a t tendency to uh, just get the job done. They're working with with smaller labor forces often than what they need because of the the shortage in in skilled labor here. Um, so so what you're seeing is that there is a lot of denial. There, there's four traditional kinds of um, risk control strategies, risk appetites that that are talked about in academia at least for cybersecurity and that's paranoid, prudent, permissive and promiscuous. And it's not that the manufacturer yeah, right. Not that the manufacturers intend to be promiscuous, but but they many of them have grown up in an environment in which they did not use information technology, interconnected technology the way it's being done today and to be competitive today more and more of these uh, production facilities are going online, whether it's because of supply chain demands, supply chain demands or customer demands. So, so for a lot of them, it's, it's unknown territory or it's less familiar territory. There are two other types of, of risk appetites that we've identified here at Manufacturer's Edge. And one is, um, is paralyzed and the other one is perplexed. And so in some cases, people just don't know where to start. You know, I, I think that's a lot of it because the, in part, some of the cyber industry, cyber technology industry has done a very good of job of marketing fear and marketing single, single point solutions that, that are fairly pricey and they're not necessarily scaled to what a small or mid-sized manufacturer is prepared to invest in something they don't necessarily see as as contributing to to product output to productivity uh, and so on. Well, and and this is uh, this is a bigger issue for. I mean, we're talking about manufacturers in general, but this is a bigger issue if you happen to be uh, a Department of Defense contractor, right? And, and in fact, I believe there's some there's some 
rules and guidelines or rules, I guess I should say, regulations coming down from on high about cybersecurity for defense contractors. Can you talk about that a bit? Sure. There is, there is a huge rule. There's, there's NIST 800-171, and basically NIST 800-171 is the implementation vehicle for DFARS. DFARS is the Defense uh, Federal Acquisition Regulation Supplemental, and there's also a FARS, which is the Federal Acquisition Regulation, and both of which are, uh, the FARS is now going the way of DFARS, so DFARS affects any company, any government vendor within the the defense and aerospace supply chain, uh, under the provisions of NIST 800-171, which has 14 control families, there there is a list of 110 control objectives uh, to which companies are supposed to, you know, which companies must review and be, if not compliant with have a plan in place, a, a program of, of actions and milestones, a POAM, that shows how that company is addressing those control objectives, how it's going to provide the kind of, of security, the kind of protections that are, that are required by the customer, by the government customer. Uh, so this is more of a, so of, a, of, a, of a security framework then. I mean, the, the, it's not like you're being told you shall, you shall implement this type of protection or, or whatnot. It's more you need to have a framework for looking at this. Is, is that what we're talking about? Right, and the 800-171 is based on the, risk, on the NIST risk management framework. And that framework is, is very logical, basically. The, the steps to the framework are identify, protect, detect, respond, recover. And now there is an, R, uh, an RMF or risk management framework 2.0 that adds prepare at the top of that. And that prepare step in the, um, in the risk management framework talks to the need to work with senior management to get not only get their buy-in, but their understanding of what the organizational risk appetite is, what the customer's risk appetite is, what the priorities are. There, there's a, an excellent memo that came out about a year ago from General Breeze from the Defense Missile Agency that articulates or identifies the top 33 highest impact control objectives. So, so to be clear, the companies do not have to be compliant with each of those control objectives today. They need to have a plan. They need to have a system security plan. They need to have a, a plan of how they're going to address any cyber security gaps that have been identified uh, with, you know, with the data attached to that, and also have an incident response plan and training and awareness for their a uh, training and awareness program for their employees. This, uh, I'm, so are, you are, with, the, uh, are you familiar with ISO, was it 27001? Yeah, 27001 this, and then the body yeah, 27002, yeah. Is, is, this, is this similar? Are they related in any way? They, they talk to one another, certainly. I mean, both have in common that the, the requirement that, or that, that documentation is huge, so basically, you say what you have, you identify what your critical assets are, what are the assets that most need be protected, and then you have uh, protocols in place that you follow to ensure that they're protected, and also to ensure that should that protection break down or, sure it, or should a, a very aggressive attacker uh, compromise your data, that you can recognize that indeed something has happened. Because one of the scariest things to, to my mind, is that a lot of companies, a lot of organizations, manufacturing and otherwise, don't know whether or not they they have indeed been compromised. And so identifying that, uh, they talk to one another quite a bit. The um, There are about 18 different sections to the 27,001, which, which is a little bit different. And of course, with NIST, we're, we're really looking at the machine shop and so forth. There are some variations so, some differences between them, but they they crosswalk pretty effectively. If you're strong in one, then you're going to be uh, aware and, and certainly have a step up on the other. Okay, um, yeah. so we've, we've we've kind of laid out what the you know, what the, the there is an issue out there. It is important. Um, so what can companies? do about it. I mean, you, you mentioned a, a framework, but a framework only 
<laughs> points out that, yeah, I have right. a problem, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so, so now what? Um, so uh, in, on a practical level, and you mentioned small companies, I mean, on a practical level, what can companies do, particularly small companies, to, right. uh, to protect themselves? A lot of it is, a, it is really common sense. One is to look at access control. So under access control, who has a password to your system and do you have strong passwords? The uh, Typically, the, the same group of 10 or so passwords are the top 10 passwords used uh, you know, year after year, globally, they're like password. And, you know, make sure that your passwords are, I say, at least 12, if not 16 characters long, and be difficult to guess. Not something like, I love you, yeah, 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 or I love you, I love you, I love you, which is one of the top passwords <laughs> from, really, right? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's like, should be common sense, but it's not, I, I can't believe it. But, um, so check your passwords, make sure that the accounts that you have, you know, the privileged accounts on your system are individually identifiable. So if, if an incident occurred, you could do an, uh, a forensics investigation. You could audit to know who made the changes to your system. So uh, I've talked with clients who say, well, we have a team of, we have a, a third party IT team that comes in and does the work. I said, okay, great. Do you, does each one have an individual log on with an individual password so that you can know if there happens to be, if somebody goes rogue among that, that team, are you going to be able to t see who, who it is, what they did, and so forth? Another is to track system logs. Uh, any, any server, any, uh, basically, all of your apps are, you can set up any of your systems, your operating systems, to track when changes are made, when somebody is accessing a system, whether there's been a print, a print job involved and so forth, and just periodically check those logs, maybe once a week or so. Just see if something is, if there's activity going on outside of work hours, which would be, which would be a flag, right? That well, something for, is for small is companies, amiss. particularly for small companies. I do, do do inside. I mean, I know most people are going to be going. Uh, we're a small company. Every employee here has been working here for for 20 years. We don't have to worry about you know an inside job, somebody stealing data. I mean, is is that true, or does it? Still happen <laughs> that you got well that's the happy version of it's not necessarily the true version I, I what I find interesting is when I talk to to large groups and I put the question out there has anybody been hacked you know the hands stay down and then I start sharing my experiences or our experiences manufacturers edge with business email compromise and everything and then then people start to share uh, one company I visited as we were leaving the meeting, I, I was told about uh, a, a, a grandmother type of someone who had been with the company maybe 40 years or so. And when she left, they realized that she had been siphoning off funds for years. It wasn't a oh, wow. huge amount of money, but you know, it added up over time. And that points to one of the other uh, important areas of concern, and that's to segregate duties and and to use to to employ least privilege, which means individuals only have access to the systems and the applications and the data that they need to get their job done. And also, that's the least privilege part of it. Segregation of duties means that an individual cannot initiate a process, approve the process and complete the process, just one individual. There's a system of check and balances, okay. basically, um, which is becomes very important for companies on, in some respects, a non-cyber side. Um, there, many have been affected by business email compromise and received the fraudulent invoices or wire transfer requests and so forth. Yeah, how do you train and people to, to, it, to recognize phishing uh, uh, I mean, I mean, it's huge. I mean, I've been, yeah. I've, I've been, I've done it. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's one yeah. of those things where you, you, you order something from UPS, yeah. and just coincidentally, you get an email from UPS saying, "Oh, your package has been held up." You know, click here. I mean, the odds yeah. are somebody is going to feel that that email applies to them when it doesn't. How do you train people to to recognize these and and to to avoid them? Oh, that's a great question. That's that's 
that's why that employee awareness training program is so important. I mean, there, there are companies that will come in and do kind of, uh, they'll test your employees by, um, uh, is it the, uh, I can't remember the name of the company, it's eluding me right now, but, but we'll test them on email safety and whether or not they are going to click on a bogus email message. One thing to do for any employee, any individual, whether in the work, in a work environment or not, is to check what the address truly is. So many right. times you get busy, you just click on something, you don't bother reading the, the whole email, the name is there, but then when if you hover your cursor over the entire email, you see that the URL is wrong. And it's just, yeah. Yeah, it's coming from, you know, Russia, from Estonia, <laughs> right. whatever. But Nigerian, yeah, Nigerianprince.com. <laughs> exactly. It's <laughs> like, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah not, that not likely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good hint. Yeah. Don't start spending that money yet. <laughs> um, no, I, I want you, b before I let you go, I want you to give you a, a, a chance to talk about, you're with the, the, uh, the MEP, uh, or you're a member of the MEP National Network, Manufacturing Extension Partnership. Um, what kind of resources along cybersecurity are available from, uh, from them and from you guys? Well, well, basically, um, NIST MEP, the Manufacturing Extension Partnership, is a constellation of 51 centers, uh, one in each state plus Puerto Rico. And at the different centers, we, we're all, the, one of the big pushes from NIST, both because of its manufacturing focus and also the mandate from Congress that it take the lead in terms of small business cybersecurity protection and awareness, uh, is is to have a cybersecurity resource, if not at the center full time, we connect with one another. So some of us, there are a group of, you know, a smaller group of us who have been doing cybersecurity for a number of years. And so like Colorado is one of the go-to centers for cybersecurity. Um, and we had, there's a wonderful cybersecurity assessment online through NIST MEP, through the, the small business, um, to the small business corner, the cybersecurity corner. Uh, if you if you uh, just log on to uh, NIST.gov, that is a great cybersecurity assessment. I did it for our organization here. We didn't do as well as I would like, you know, in the way I assess, assessed us. But um, but it, it it helps you see where you are. Uh, the other resources exist throughout NIST. The, the 800 guidelines are, are terrific. There's a handbook on cybersecurity that was developed by, by NIST that is, and I'm going to look down because I've, right now my, the, the uh, numbers have eluded me, but there's a NIST handbook on security, which is what I, uh, I actually use as a reference when I'm doing the a cyber gap analysis on a customer site. Because some of the terminology, quite frankly, in the NIST 800-171, feels a bit, um, it, it feels a bit obscure. It's not the way you necessarily. It's not necessarily always language that is familiar. And we have uh, a lot of blogs on the NIST MEP website that that bring it down into more practical, more pragmatic, more kinetic world terms in terms of you know, about what what cybersecurity means, what you can do, how you define things like access control, least privilege, segregation of, of duty, segment. Whoop. We still, we still have you there, Jennifer? Oh, I think we, we may have lost Jennifer. Well, we were actually about at the end of it here anyway. I noticed her audio was starting to, uh, uh, to have some problems. That was via Skype. Uh, I think we're trying to reconnect and, we'll, and then we'll wrap it up with her. So uh, she did mention the NIST website, the uh, nist.gov slash MEP, and I believe uh, that's where the resources were that we were talking about there. So uh, looks like we're not gonna be able to get uh, Jennifer back, uh, but that was actually the end of, uh, that was the last question for her. So as she said, uh, there's a lot of information on this from NIST, so nist.gov slash MEP. Uh, there's also a physical link out there underneath our player page down there that you can click on. So, uh, well, thanks Jennifer <laughs> for joining us today on Quality Digest Live. Uh, Jennifer Kirch, Cyber Program Director at Manufacturers Edge. All right, that is it for today's Quality Digest Live. Uh, as I always say, if you have 
have some ideas of who you would like to have on the show or some topic you would like us to cover, let us know at qdl at qualitydigest.com and we will try to cover those topics or bring those people on the show. All right, that's it for today. We will see you next week. So long.